Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, uh, and welcome to another one among the series of presentations that I've been doing uh, virtually since the beginning of COVID. Uh, this one is about family feuds and how to avoid them. There are a number of kinds of family feuds that show up. There are ways to avoid them. There are also ways to kind of help you focus on winning them if you're have to, having to have a family feud. But let me just talk about this for a while. So you've, if you've seen presentations of mine, you know that I always talk about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, they have a very simple goal in life. Frank and Mary want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Uh, after that, they're figuring that their assets are just going to get divided up among their kids. And so usually, I often start my presentations this way, and then for purposes of reference, I talk about the things that Frank and Mary own, the big things, and what they're worth. The point about family feuds is that that's irrelevant. How much their house is worth, what's in their bank account, it's not relevant. Family feuds happen no matter how much money, how little or how much you have, it, no matter whether you're, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're in construction or you're an investment banker, family feuds just happen. Now, let me just kind of talk about the reasons why they happen. Family feuds are unrelated, unrelated to dollar amounts. Um, there are very few exceptions, one of which I'll mention. So, and, and family feuds, as far as Frank and Mary are concerned, are going to happen because they're assuming, hey, they know all of their kids, and the kids are, you know, in many cases, the kids are great, you know, and the kids talk, you know, and everything is going to be great. Um, or they just don't want to think about it because they know that, that at least among a few of the siblings, there have been some arguments. Maybe there's some family history going way back. Who knows? Now, that doesn't mean that all three of their kids are bad either. You know, it doesn't mean that they're all great. It doesn't mean that they're all bad. It just means that you want to be sensitive to things that you might do or that you could avoid doing because in, in order to avoid family feuds. Uh, now there was nothing that, that these people could do to avoid this. I have a colleague uh, who told me about, this is kind of a legendary case in our firm. This colleague does nothing but family feuds. One of the advantages of being at Myrick O'Connell, there were 70 of us so everybody gets to do what they like doing. I always hated doing feuding when I was in practice myself and with a few other lawyers. I have lawyers that love doing feuding, and so that's great. So she always mentions the, the famous um, cardboard Santa that, um, w that the kids were fighting over who's going to get the cardboard Santa. So uh, the child we represented actually spent about $30,000 on attorney's fees with us. We don't know how much the others spent. The point was, it, clearly this wasn't about the Santa. This was not about the Santa. And, and that, those issues, you're not going to get around. But typically, family feuds are based on there's some bad blood, something happened between somebody, uh, and or, and I say and or, even when there hasn't been bad blood, there is financial stress. One of the, ch typically family feuds are about money. And one of the kind of standard reasons why there's a feud is that somebody among the kids has got stresses. They've got uh, business problems, they've got, you know, there's, a, there's a divorce coming, there's some kind of problem. And so that's why they're feuding, because they need the money, right? And then there is ambiguity. T typically, when you get to this point and there's going to be a family feud, if, you, if, you're ha if you've structured things correctly and your documents are clear, then the lawyer for the people who are going to be fighting is saying, well, there's no reason to fight because here's the, what the answer is. This is what the judge is going to say because everything is clear. So ambiguity combined with bad blood and financial stress really are the cause of many, many family feuds. So let me talk about the family feuds that I have, I have seen a lot of. They, they really fall into five categories. The three that happen after you die. There are a couple that happen before you die. The family feuds that happen after you die. Number one, the will contest. Somebody feel there is a will and somebody feels that they are not getting what they deserve to get as a result of that will. And therefore, they're gonna fight about the will. That's the reason why there are will contests. It's because somebody thinks that they should be getting more and that others should be getting less. So first of all, if you have a will, there are only three ways in which a, a court could find that that will is going to be invalid. Well, actually, there is a fourth. 
if you if you have done a will and you then did another will well then the new will always takes precedence signing a new one always takes precedence over the old one. Oh, I should mention there's actually a fifth way you could get married people often don't realize that if you signed a will and in the will you didn't specify that it was signed in anticipation of marriage and you then get married you've automatically revoked your will interestingly a divorce does not revoke a will but the marriage does so you want to be aware of that so but if you've signed the will voluntarily and if it was your free act and if you are over 18 then whatever is said in the will is going to apply to the division of your uh, assets. So the, 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 and so the question then is really going to be, did you sign it voluntarily? The over 18 is easy to figure. Did you sign it voluntarily? And did you sign it as your free act and deed? And usually when you hear the term free act and deed, you're thinking, did you sign it with a gun to your head? Um, but in the more typical case, the argument is, you really didn't sign it voluntarily because A, you weren't well, uh, and B, someone was exercising undue influence over you. You weren't well, um, you were constantly dealing with one particular child who was saying, you know, Ma, the, these other two, you know, they haven't done anything for you, and so you really ought to, you, you really ought to change your will. And, and so the question that would be before the court in that kind of will contest is, was that what happened? Was that what happened? Because if you were of sound mind um, and, and there wasn't a gun to your head, you're totally free to, do, to give assets to whomever you want. And it doesn't make any difference if the kids think it's fair. So the, in terms of dealing with that issue though, there were kind of two ways that you could kind of think about it. And so the bad news about will contests is that they are slow to resolve. They always happen in the probate court. And so it's a very, there's a very public process. The way you solve a will contest is you actually have a trial and you bring people to that trial and typically you're bringing medical people in and others because now the person who who's the trial is about is dead. So you need all of these third parties to be talking about how that person was acting uh, at around the time when they signed that will. And so it's a very public process, it's a trial, so it's expensive, it's expensive to everybody. Um, and so the question is, and, and, and if, if you've wrote, written a will in which things aren't being divided equally, or you think that there may be this kind of disagreement, then one, alter one alternative is to make sure that you've written the will as soon as possible, preferably not while you're in the nursing home if you're gonna die, and you're gonna die in another couple of days. But the other way to deal with it is to avoid having to go through this probate process completely um, and doing a revocable and amendable trust. You could structure things by keeping ownership of property while you're alive, uh, by creating a revocable and amendable trust. What, revocable in that whatever you put in, you can always take out. Amendable in that you can change the rules while you're alive. You could keep control of these assets as the trustee of the trust, or if you're Frank and Mary as the joint trustees, and if one dies, the other is the sole trustee. And then following the death of the two of you, you'd name one of the other kids or a third party. If you think there's going to be fighting, you may want to name a third party. That's actually the, those are the, that's the one case where I suggest to people that they may want to have the lawyer involved. If they know there's going to be fighting and they just have a third party who is, who, who is going to be able to deal with all this stuff. But you can name anybody that you want. And the point about assets that are in trust is that they don't go through the probate process. They don't go through the probate process. So, so nobody in order to get the, these assets resolved is gonna have to get the, the approval of a judge and is therefore gonna have to have a process where the people who are mad about these distributions have this ability to contest all of that. So that's a, a way out of it. Um, the second standard family feud, and we do this a lot, is the joint asset problem. Um, if, if one of you owns something jointly with somebody else, and, and by the way, this typically doesn't happen when, when, fr when Frank dies and marries the sole owner of the assets. It's the reason why typically probate doesn't happen is that Frank and Mary probably own their assets jointly, so if one dies, the other one gets everything. This typically happens though, if one spouse is left and, and there's some reason to favor one child over others. Now, sometimes that reason is that because is you have a child who is especially needy. You have a child who has a special need, uh, who really has never been able to earn the money that they need in order to live, and so you're trying to provide for that child. 
Um, a very common reason, a second reason though, and the one that is the source of most of these fights, um, is the, pr the child who has been providing care. The one who has been at home with you, or coming to your home a lot, or taking care of you, and, you, and you're, so you say to yourself, well, this is a child, and some, sometimes th these people, have, they've given up their jobs in order to move in, in order to do these other things. So you'll, people will say, well, you know, I really want to take care of that person. Now, the way that, that people are often tempted to take care of that person is completely outside of the will, because in their will, they'll typically say everything is going to get divided in three, or in, in the case of Peter, Paul, and Mary, Jr., but to, but to take particular assets, often the house or a joint account, and to, and to retitle those assets, to name that, that person, in this case we're going to say Mary Jr., the person who was taking care of Ma after Dad died and, and had provided a lot of care, uh, and had moved in, and so Mary said, I'm going to give Mary Jr. the house, but rather than putting that in the will, I'm simply going to do a deed right now that says that when I die, Mary becomes the sole owner of the house. Or, maybe I'm not going to give Mary the house, but I have a bank account. It has a couple hundred thousand dollars in it. And, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to name Mary as the joint owner on that bank account. Because legally, uh, if, if something is owned jointly by two people and one person dies, the other person becomes, it is presumed that the other person becomes the new owner. That presumption, though, is rebuttable. It is rebuttable if it can be demonstrated, and this is the source of this family feud, if it can be demonstrated typically by the person who is the personal representative, used to be called the executor of the estate, that that bank account joint ownership was only for the convenience of Mary Sr. So that Mary Jr. could go to the bank and take care of the finances. And that Mary Sr. never intended that upon her death, Mary Jr. was going to be the sole owner of the property. Um, there is an argument that can be made, even if the house was deeded, that the same thing is true. Uh, but typically, this argument happens when there's a bank account involved. So, how do you deal with that? Well, you know, there are a couple of ways. First of all, what you don't want to do is leave the possibility open that there's going, that court's going to have to handle this. That basically, the personal representative is going to have to file a, after the, after the will has been probated and the personal representative has been named, probably in this case Peter or Paul, that they are going to then ha have to sue Mary Jr. saying that the assets in that account should have been part of the probate estate and therefore should have been divided equally among the kids instead of simply going to Mary Jr. I've had this case. I've had several versions of this case. In each one, the client, whether it was the personal representative or the surviving joint owner spent in the neighborhood of thirty to fifty thousand dollars to get this result, because these cases involve having a trial, and the trial is to determine what Mary's, in this case, Mary Senior's intention was, and she's dead, so it's very expensive. In this case, once again, you've got two ways of, of trying to keep this from happening. One, make sure the will is clear. If you want to leave something special to Mary, put it in the will and make sure that you're clear that that's what you're doing and that that's why you want to leave it that way. Or second, once again, avoid probate. Avoid probate. Uh, either have the account held in trust by Mary or have the house held in trust by Mary. Specify in the trust, following my death, this particular asset or these assets are going to go to Mary Jr. and all the rest of the assets are going to be divided equally. The point is by structuring things this way you're avoiding the probate court and therefore really reducing the chances that there's going to be an argument. Family feud number three, asset management after you die. <clears throat> so in this particular case we're going to assume that Mary figured, well you know, I'm going to, I totally trust my son Peter. You know, he's the oldest of the three, he's a businessman, he's got business sense. I'm going to name him both on my power of attorney so that Peter can be dealing things while I'm alive and in my will I'm going to name him as the personal representative. That is the person who's going to be in charge of managing things through the will. And it may be that Peter is absolutely the right person. Uh, or it may be that he's not. It may be that he's not. It may be He's got this business, but it's not doing so well. But he's not talking to his mom about that. Or it may be that he's got financial problems at home. 
It may be that there's a divorce that's coming. There could be, maybe that his wife has a gambling problem. Who knows? Who knows? The point is, you can't be sure about any of this stuff. It, or, and it may be uh, that Peter, the businessman, who is always used to being in control, thinks his siblings are just useless, right? And, and would never try to have them participate in any of these decisions regarding the, the asset distribution following Mary's death. So, the, for, first, before we talk about kind of dealing with this issue, let me talk about the probate process for a second. So if you die, leaving assets in your own name, uh, without a named death beneficiary, those assets are going to go through probate. Uh, the probate process involves somebody going to court and saying, you died, and either presenting the will, saying, here's how ma or dad or whoever proposed to have things divided up so that the will can be accepted by the court as the last will and testament. Or, by, or, you, or somebody would file and say, there is no will, and therefore the assets need to be divided according to the rules of intestacy. In this case, that would mean if Frank were dead and Mary had then di later died, that the assets would simply be divided among the three kids, exactly what Mary had, would have said or said in her will. Um, but the point is that, that in order for anything to happen, um, the court has to name somebody as a personal representative, used to be called the administrator or the executor, <clears throat> excuse me, and then a period of time has to happen during creditors can file claims against these assets and in the meantime, the personal representative is supposed to marshal the assets, collect them all up, and hold them until the end of that creditor period. Creditors have one year from date of death in order to file a claim against the probate estate. So that's why probates always take at least a year and a day, because you can't distribute the assets until the personal representative is sure that there are no creditors. So that's the pro, and then there is a final distribution. Um, and, and among other things, uh, before those final distributions can get made, or get made, the personal representative has the right to get paid. A long time ago, but I, when I was first practicing law, those payments would typically be based on a percentage of the total assets. That like never happens anymore. Uh, pro, the personal representative typically gets paid hourly. If there's a, is a contest about that or an argument about it, the probate court gets to decide how much the, the personal representative should get paid. Um, we have seen, at least in Middlesex County, where I do a lot of work, that typically judges will allow uh, a, a payment of about $50 an hour, um, but it's totally, this is totally in the discretion of the judge. So, uh, if you are, in this case, if you are Peter, and you really are a good, solid citizen, and you're just trying to do everything right, um, the best way to avoid feuds about any of this stuff is, A, transparency. Talk to your siblings. Tell them about the process. Tell them how long it's going to be. If you, if you hired an attorney, you may even want to do a conference call with them and the attorney. I found that's really helpful a lot of times in answering questions. Um, communicate with your siblings. Do things as quickly as possible. Uh, the, once, once again, the clock for getting all of this st stuff done in the typical case is a year and a day. So you want to make sure if you're Peter that a year and a day after mom or dad has died, you're ready to give out the checks because people know when they're, or think they, they know now when they're going to be getting money, and some people will have just like spent it ahead of time. So they start making plans based on the money they're going to get. So if you're not delivering the checks, it's just as bad. Third thing is, if you're planning on charging a fee, if you're planning, which you're entitled to do, but if you're planning, but although many personal representatives who are family members don't, if you're planning on it, tell your siblings ahead of time, talk to them about it, if there's going to be a problem, then you may want to go talk to the judge ahead of time. The way that problem typically gets resolved is by having a court, the probate court, decide how much to get paid. Um, on the other side, suppose Peter is being, for one of the better terms, a jerk, is not talking to anybody. Uh, is, you're thinking he's charging a lot of money. You have no idea what, what, what's happening with the money. Your alternatives, at, if you're Paul or Mary Jr. are, you can file a petition with the court for an accounting. You can say to the court, we don't know what's going on, and we want, we want to find out. And the court will, will, you have the right to that as, these beneficia as beneficiaries, the court will give you that. You can also file a petition to have Peter removed as the personal representative. You should be aware, though, that in cases where there are these kinds of fights, 
If you're getting him removed, you're not going to get appointed in his place. The court is going to appoint a third party in his place. If, if the courts, if they see a fight happening, they're going to go to a third party. That third party is probably going to be a lawyer, and that's probably going to be a big extra expense. There's also going to be, th this, this feuding is going to cost you money. So one solution is avoid probate. We talked about the joint ownership alternative, but that has some issues around it. I keep going back, though, to this notion of a revocable and amendable trust. If you want to avoid the probate process, structure things that way so that when you die, the person that you trust is going to be the new trustee and can take over right away. There's no one year delay. There's no creditor filings. You may want to put a provision in there in case there is an issue between, in this case, Peter and the other siblings that give those siblings the ability in some way to either to ask for an accounting or to remove Peter by a majority vote. You may want to think, or you may want to name a third party trustee if you think there's going to be trouble. Finally, I want to talk about two feuds that sometimes occur while you're alive. The first one, assume this, Frank is dead, Mary is now not doing so well, and Peter was named as the, as, as the attorney on the power of attorney, but, Pete, but, the, but Paul and Mary Jr. are wondering about what's going on with Peter. He isn't communicating. It, the, no one has any idea what's happening with these funds. What do you do? This is a real problem. Mary, of course, would always have the right to revoke that power of attorney, but will she? And does she have the competence to do it? And if she does it and then appoints another attorney, and then Peter goes to Mary's house the next day and says, Ma, what are you doing? And so now she does a new power of attorney back to Peter. We, I always call these the battle of the powers of attorney. I played this, we've played this game. And the question is, if you're in that situation, how do you resolve it? Well, the only, the only official way to resolve it is to have someone um, have Mary declared to be not competent to handle her financial affairs and have a conservator appointed. This is a really expensive process. Any one of the kids could file this petition in the probate court, but you're gonna need a medical certificate from a, a, a doctor based on, a, 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 based on having seen Mary within the previous 30 days, talking about competence. And then if you're fighting, I've seen a lot of these cases, the cost of this is gonna be somewhere between 10 and $50,000, depending on how much fighting is happening. Does there need to be a trial about Mary's competence? Um, and if people are fighting, none of the, the children are gonna get appointed as the conservator. The court's gonna appoint a third party as the conservator. Right? So, and, and it, by the way, in, in Mary's power of attorney, she may have actually nominated Peter to be the conservator in the event that a conservator is appointed, right? So that's just, the judge isn't required to do that, but the judge may. So you need to be aware of all of that stuff. The solution, I'm going to go back, I don't want to be sounding like I'm just using the same line over and over, a revocable and amendable trust. Name, name Mary as the trustee, name Peter if Mary wants to name Peter as the successor trustee, that's great, um, but, make sure, but make sure that that only happens if some third party, say a it doesn't have to be a doctor, it could be a doctor, it could be a lawyer, says that that person really need, uh, is not competent to handle things anymore. You may want to name a third party trustee if you think the kids might be fighting about this, and you may want to give the other kids the ability to remove the trustee in the situations that I talked about. Finally, there's the need for guardianship. Um, in, in this case, guardianship only applies to care for Mary. It doesn't apply to dealing with Mary's assets. So this typically happens if there's a nursing home or if there are health care issues involved. The, health, the person who Mary has named as her health care proxy ideally is taking care of all of the medical decisions, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're unwilling to do it. Or maybe Mary has, is unwilling to follow the, what, the, what the proxy says and if she does, if, she, if she's will, unwilling to follow what the proxy says, automatically that means she has revoked the proxy. There is no good solution to this, right? Someone has to, has to go and ask a judge to become that person's guardian. That, person, that process is going to be expensive. There may be a person whom Mary has nominated in her healthcare proxy or her power of attorney as the guardian. But I'll tell you, if, if the, it, ideally, no one's fighting about this and everybody's agreeing we need to be dealing with Ma and we need to be doing something. If everybody's agreeing, this co the cost of all of this is going to be between five dollars and $10,000. If people are fighting about it, A, it's going to cost a lot more, and B, a third party is going to be named as the, uh, as the uh, guardian. So, in summary, 
Clarity helps. Clarity helps. You're not going to get rid of the bad blood. You're not going to get rid of the financial people, um, um, stresses that people may be dealing with. But you can help the whole process by being clear. You can also help the, pro the or, or you can also reduce the likelihood of family feuds by avoiding probate, which would mean typically doing a revocable and amendable trust. Uh, or if you're expecting a fight, name third parties to handle the assets. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. If you've got any questions, as, I know, as you know, my goal, as I always tell my clients, the goal of life at our age is to, is, to, is, to be, is to be getting a good night's sleep. If you're worried about any of this stuff, talk to an attorney. If you want to talk to me, uh, give me a call. My best number is 508-860-1470. Thank you very much, and we'll look forward to talking to you next month.